Welcome to Econ Roots, your podcast on the roots of economic thought. I'm Stefan. And I'm Otto. Let's get on with today's conversation. Hello and welcome, everybody. And thank you once again for spending time with us in our journey over all the uh, Nobel laureates in economic science. And once again, I'm jo- I'm Stefan, and I'm joined here with... Otto. Uh, are you good, Otto? I hope so. That's good. And ready to discuss uh, today's topic. Perfect. And uh, today's topic is um, the um, uh, modern macro part one. And we will be discussing three laureates today. We'll be discussing Hicks, we'll be discussing Lucas, and we'll be discussing, be discussing Tobin. So uh, we'll start with Hicks, and I'll just give a short bio, and then we'll talk a little bit about his contributions to this field. So his full name is Sir John Rickard Hicks. He was born in on the 8th of April uh, 1904, and he died on the 20th of May uh, 1989. He was a British economist, so not an American. So uh, most people are American in this uh, in this show, but he's a, he's British. Uh, he got his pre- uh, his prize for his uh, pioneering contribution to general equilibrium theory and welfare theory. And he shared his prize. He shared his prize with Arrow, which we'll cover in a later episode. And they got the prize in 1972. Um, he was born in Warwick in the UK. His mother was a homemaker. His dad, a local journalist who convinced him to study economics. He studied at Oxford, started his career at London School of Economics, um, where he met a lot of the people who, at this early stage in economic uh, theory, were very prominent, like Hayek and others. He also met his future wife there, actually, uh, fellow economist Ursula Webb. Um, he was also at Cambridge, at Manchester University, before finally ending his, his career at Oxford. So, uh, so uh, why did Hicks get the prize? Well, today we're discussing uh, modern macro. Um Actually, uh, he got his prize uh, mainly for his contributions to uh, general equilibrium theory, which we will go get get back to that. Um, get that back to that. But but he he has a place when we're talking modern macro. Um, uh, it's a sudden role, a sudden role, um, which makes him interesting. Um, he was. Uh, one of the first model builders. Um, so actually, he, he he built this general equilibrium model as a model of the uh, the entire economy uh, or the structure of the entire economy. That's the idea in, in the general equilibrium model, and that's what what he did. But also, that is uh, what has become the standard uh, in macroeconomics is that we're trying to model uh, the entire economy, not not everything in the economy, but the structure of the uh, entire eco- economy. When we're talking macroeconomics, we're talking about uh, dynamics. We're talking how does uh, the, uh, the economy move, especially over the business cycle. Um, in a general equilibrium model, uh, there's not much uh, 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 dynamics that we are looking at one state of the economy comparing mm. it to another state of the of the economy but 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 the idea of building a model of the entire economy uh, to a large extent came came from Hicks so 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 he was important and he also uh, drew the blackboard model which has been widely used and widely <laughs> misused <laughs> uh, but used by by students the ISLM model uh, which is picturing the the macroeconomy as uh, the an interaction between uh, the monetary part the um, and the the real part the savings investment part and and the supply and demand for money and the the, the uh, where it, the two parts are, are tied together by by the level of of economic growth and by the interest rate. Yeah. That is certainly something that every student who takes an introductory macro course will be exposed to that model. Uh, if nothing else, to just go on to further models, basically, yeah. it's often used as, as that. Um, and and I think you're right that he's important as 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 one of the first model builders. He um, he very famously developed his theories 
at the same time as Keynes, but actually claimed he didn't know what Keynes was talking about uh, while he was doing it. Like, like they were working in separate ways. It might seem odd they were in the same country, they weren't that far apart, but but back then, you know, uh, 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 no internet, basically any phones, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. So so it might actually be true, but but they come up with many of the same ideas, and uh, right? So um, the, the stuff you said about the, uh, the equilibrium model is also interesting, right? Because even though we are, we are beyond that point now in economic science, at least back then, it's it's an interesting mo- model because it's sort of a model of when the economy is finished, right? With like, well, it, it's it's a model of, of, of what what characterizes an economy put put to rest when yeah. when when and 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 but it, that can be interesting to to look at. Yeah. it is interesting to yeah. to look at. It's uh, like it's. It's a great tool to understand uh, and, and simplify some complexities, right? But uh, um, but not that great at, at capturing the, the the dynamics that's going on, which is which was something that Higgs was actually really well aware of. One of the reasons why I quite like reading Higgs is because he, you can see that his time, especially at LSE, really rubbed up on him. He's very open to the criticism, often rates towards more maybe. Uh, mechanically oriented macroeconomist. He's very open to the fact that there are challenges with doing macroeconomics. Mm. Uh, famously, he he accepts many of, I guess you could Hayekian criticism about how you measure capital. For instance, ha- capital is not homogeneous. It's very much heterogeneous. But even labor is right. I mean, labor is not just counting heads or hours because people don't work the same and and all these things. So I actually think he's a very well rounded scholar in many ways. Yes. Well, yeah. Yes. Um, and his uh, his main work was the value and capital that was published in 1939. For those that's really interested, um, so, so he's, he's he's really a, a, a very early uh, participant in 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 the debate we are covering here. So yeah, yeah, and and a well deserved prize, I think, uh, if nothing else, just for 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 those original contributions mm-hmm. are very important. Um, all right. Well, we might return to him later on when we get to Arrow anyway. So, so let's leave him for now, right, and, and move on to uh, to Lucas, right? So uh, Lucas' full name is Robert Emerson Lucas Jr. He was born in September 15th, 1937. In, he's an American, as most people are here. He got the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1995. He got it for having developed and applied the hypothesis of rational expectations and thereby having transformed macroeconomic analysis and deepened our understanding of economic policy. Wow, that's a lot. We'll get into that in a moment. Um, he, A really fun thing about him is that he actually started to study economics because he was a history student. <laughs> And even even more so, he was a quasi Marxist history student, right? <laughs> Which is such an interesting thing. So, so since uh, Max uh, teaches that uh, that the economy drives the world, of course, if you're interested in that, you should study economics. That did not turn out well for him in terms of staying <laughs> of, of staying a, a Marxian. But we can talk about that in a moment. Uh, just to finish up his um, his bio very shortly, he he. He was at Carnegie Mellon before going back to Chicago, um, and he's also uh, married twice. And um, there's a fun story about uh, his divorce, right, uh, related to rational expectations. Yeah, he, he was a leader of the so-called rational expectations revolution. We're going to talk about in in in, in a moment, um, but basically, it rests on the idea that it, the agents have rational expectations for the future. Um, and as a re- I remember it, uh, he, 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 in the divorce agreement, uh, it was stated that if he won the Nobel Prize, uh, his former wife should have a share of it. And uh, he got it, uh, I think, if he got it within 10, 10 years, and I think he got it exactly <laughs> in the 10th year. <laughs> so uh, so maybe he was not so, uh, didn't have rational expectations, but this is wise. <laughs> so <if he> did. <laughs> I guess we could call that a bit of sweet victory. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, um, by that story, we already sort of started explaining what rational expectations are, but uh, that is one of Lucas' main points, right? That people act with rational expectation based on available information. So let's try to unwrap that a little bit. Yes, I think we have talked about expectations uh, in, in, in our last uh, episode. Uh, we, 
moved from uh, Keynes and Keynesians who uh, basically didn't have a theory about people forming expectations. They would just uh, stick to their expectations. And, and of course, if they do that, if they don't change it, they be, you can do a lot of things. Um, uh, Milton Friedman realized that, that people learn from experience. So in his monetarism, adaptive expectations uh, became very important. And the idea of the, the the Phillips curve being vertical in the long run exactly reflects this. That in, maybe in the short run, you can uh, you can change a, uh, unemployment by increasing inflation. But as soon as people realize that uh, their real wages haven't gone up, only their money wages, but not their real wages, then we, we will get back to the natural rate of unemployment, as, as Friedman called it. Uh, but um, Lucas uh, and the rational expectation uh, school uh, or revolution took this idea a step uh, further. And actually, uh, I think if you should point to where this revolution started, it was in the 1960s and it was uh, an American economist uh, called uh, John Muth who asked an extremely important question. Um, uh, his question was, if uh, you have an economic model and uh, it assumes something about the agents in it. If those agents, by knowing the model, could do better than they do in the model, would you expect the model uh, to, to be able to predict the future um, uh, consistently? So if, 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 the, if the model tells the agents that they are doing something wrong, <laughs> why shouldn't they realize this? And why shouldn't they realize it uh, on beforehand, mm -hmm. uh, rather than than learning it uh, along the way as they do in 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 Friedman's monetarism. Mm -hmm. and so what Muth really said was, you must have a, a sort of equilibrium between the the agent and the model. Uh, and if if the model tells the agent that they, they can do better than they do in the model, then we should expect them to 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 change their behavior in the model. So that was really the basic idea, um, and um, and that was the idea that 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 Lucas really took uh, and implemented. Asked what is going to happen to macroeconomics if we accept the idea that people form rational expectations. Um, and that has transformed uh, uh, macroeconomics completely and all modern macroeconomists to, uh, to some extent accept the, the idea of rational expectations. It's, it's of course, it's, it's important to, maybe we should discuss this, what, what, what rational expectations uh, really is uh, it's uh, sometimes people understand it as if agents have perfect foresight. So um, if the, and that's not what it means. Oh, it's that's not, not no, what it means. No. It it means exactly as you pointed out uh, in the beginning. It means that people they utilize the uh, available. Experience uh, information exactly makes sense, and it means, and they they will often make mistakes. Um, that's that's not the point that people don't make mistakes. Uh, so they make mistakes, and you can call some of them even irrational if you like to. But the idea is that these mistakes are not uh, biased in a specific uh, direction. So we all make mistakes all the time. I tend to be over-optimistic uh, sometimes, uh, but I would be balanced out by the fact that you tend to be uh, under, uh, over-pessimistic <laughs> over is the right word here. So so, uh, so it's only if, if, if we and, and all the other agents in the economy make uh, the same 
uh, mistake or mistake in the same direction that it will have an influence. Whereas uh, if it if 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 it averages out, uh, then it 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 won't have uh, that effect. And that of course was was really important to to realize that uh, the, you need to have. Uh, to understand business cycle, you really need to understand uh, an asymmetry in the mistakes that people are making, and yep. that's really the, the 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 route that macroeconomics took after Lucas. You are listening to Econ Roots, your podcast on the history of economic thought. Thank you for joining the conversation. I think one of the reasons why his critique was so successful was because, and you mentioned this earlier uh, in your very nice presentation of the ideas here, is that this has a real impact on one of the main Keynesian uh, battle points or concession points, the idea of sticky wages. So what kind of wages are unions, for instance, uh, fighting to raise uh, in terms of inflation and so on? And uh, this was something that many Keynesians had to admit that they were actually... They were, of course, focused on real wages. Like you know, they weren't stupid, right? Like so, um, and and this is a very important uh, part of the mo- modern macro discussion. Is actually like the idea of expectation, and uh, and and it wasn't really powerful impact on policy. Um, but of course, again, many people don't understand this, uh, exactly what rationalism is and and, and these things. Um, I think Lucas is an interesting scholar, and and I, and I think many people agree with me. If nothing else, he has several things named after him, which is always a good sign, right? <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about some of those, like the the original Lucas critique. Should we talk a little bit about yes. that? Yeah, that's also a very important contribution. And what he really was pointing out, the re- Lucas critique, is the fact that you, when you look at, if you're trying to 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 influence behavior. Uh, by policy, then you should realize if the behavior you are already uh, observing is influenced by the present policies. Uh, so, if you don't realize that, then you 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 you, uh, you won't be able to uh, to forecast the effect of what your change, uh, what your your policy change uh, correctly. Uh, I think that this is a very good. <laughs> Example of this uh, used very often. So let's let's use it too. And um, um, if you look at uh, which banks in the U.S. that has never been tried to be robbed, uh, Fort Knox, <laughs> uh, where the Federal Reserve have all their gold, and I guess a lot of other central banks in the world have all their gold in Fort Knox. Um, and but it has never been attempted to be robbed. Uh, so um, uh, one conclusion could be that th- they shouldn't spend a lot of money guarding Fort Knox. <laughs> <laughs> be- 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 <laughs> uh, and of course, the, the the reason why it has never they have never attempted to be robbed, uh, at least not successfully, uh, is that it is so heavily guarded. <laughs> so if you drew the conclusion that you should. Uh, you should pull away uh, all the security guards, and you could just leave the the goal uh, on the ground, uh, because nobody attempts to rob it. Then uh, <laughs> you'll you'll end up making a mistake. And uh, Lucas p- pointed out that that very often um, economic policy advice was based on the assumption that uh, that that uh, the uh, uh, that behavior was not influenced by by existing policy, and um, and 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 very often it is. So you need to go a layer deeper to uh, if if you want you need to understand behavior on a much deeper level uh, if you want to make policies. And that's a very important insight. I actually think this is something that he got from history. To be honest, like if you're a good historian, you even. Maybe not if you are a good Marxist historian, but generally, if you're a good historian, you do know that 
it to a far degree history is created by the actions of people, right? And and, and sure you can you can look at historical evidence such as economic data. It's historical evidence, but there is a reason why it is the way it is, and the data alone is is not neutral. It's it's from the action of people. Um, another way where I think he actually has at least something to teach his historians is the Lucas Vetch, which is another thing named for him. Like the difference between the current state of the economy and how good it could be if the right policy had been followed, right? Mm. And I think that's such an interesting historical question. Of course, it's it's counterfactual, maybe it's for many historians to look at like that. But I think it is valuable. It's interesting. Yes. Like uh, certainly here in Denmark, it's interesting what would have happened if we had pursued less redistribution, for instance, and these kind of things. Yes, it is. It is uh, actually uh, Hicks. We just talked about. Yeah. Uh, was uh, was interested in in what is called a distortion. Uh, if, if we're talking uh, in, in in a general equilibrium model, trying to measure distortions, yeah. uh, but uh, what the Lucas which is about is really a distortion in a dynamic uh, yeah. uh, model instead. Uh, but but basically, it's the same concept. Yeah. Um, and the final thing, at least that I know that's named after him, is the Lucas paradox, right? Um, so if we should, should briefly talk about that. Um, Do you want to go or should I go? You go. You go. Yes. So uh, the Lucas paradox is um, the 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 wondering why more uh, capital resources doesn't move from high income countries to low income countries, basically, and that's a paradox because normally you should think capital would go where it is, um, where there's the both uh, where there's the best uh, profit from it from investing it and. But that doesn't happen. So that's the paradox, basically. And it's something that takes up a lot of time in development economics. And it is a field I'm not very well worse in, but it's definitely something that's interesting that he pointed out empirically. Yes, he he, he did also contribute to to growth theory. We're going to, to discuss that in, in another episode. And and this is really an, an important uh, question. Is, uh, basically, Lucas is asking, is not, completely successful in answering the question, but he's asking why aren't all countries, uh, why don't have the, the, the same income? Exactly, yeah. Uh, so why why is it that uh, India or uh, or Poland, they don't, countries that are poorer than, than, than Denmark or the US, why don't they just copy what we do? Yeah. And why don't they, uh, why the, Why don't investment flow from 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 Denmark and and, and US to to Poland and India? Uh, they they do to, they to a certain do, extent, of course, but, yeah, but, of course, but, but they don't so even on. out. So, so that's a very interesting question. Yeah, why why aren't we all the, at the same level of, of wealth? Yeah, exactly. And obviously, that's a question that institutionalism also tries to attempt to answer. And nowadays, uh, I guess actually the answer is probably like. Uh, uh, moral philosophy and uh, or moral psychology maybe is also trying to answer that question. It's it's a fundamentally interesting answer. Like, is also exactly what what makes the West unique uh, because it's mainly the West that are not just but mainly the West that are in the high income bracket. All right, so the last star of today is uh, Tobin. Uh, and maybe if we went more chronologically, we should have taken him between the two, but we thought it was more exciting to take him in the end. So, <laughs> uh, But um, before we get into him, and, and I'll do a little bit on his bio, um, I found something in his accepted speech, which I found was such an interesting quote. Um, so um, so let's talk about that, and, uh, and then we can talk about his contributions. So I'm just going to quote from it now. As my great teacher, Joseph Schumpeter, said, A subject so close to politics and policy inadvertently blends ideology and science. The vision and energy that brings new ideas are often ideological and political, but free professional scrutiny selects the ideas to serving of survival. This process has in the past transferred conflict into stronger synthesis, and I'm optimistic it will do so again. I love that quote. It's a great quote. And I think it also sums up some of our conversation here because with macroeconomics, it's hard not to make it political, right? There's elements of that because it has to do with policy, right? Um, so, and it's also a great quote from a more nerdy point of view in that he is quoting his uh, PhD, not quoting, but he's 
um, uh, at least referring to um, his uh, his PhD supervisor, Joseph Schumpeter, who was anything but a Keynesian. He was definitely not a Keynesian, <laughs> but Tobin was. So <laughs> I like that. It shows how uh, when science is great, we can talk together and disagree on a good level. So uh, um, uh, James Tobin, uh, was, uh, which was his full name, was born on March 5th, 1918. He died on March 11, 2002. He was an American. No surprise there. Uh, he got the prize in 81. Uh, for his analysis of financial markets and their relations to expenditure decisions, employment, productions, and prices. Uh, he was very active in advising policy. He served in uh, like the Federal Reserve, Council of Economic uh, um, Advisors, and so on. Um, his dad was a journalist and a World War I veteran. And uh, while he mo his mom was a social worker, so again, we have this um, very um, socially aware, at least, uh, family background. Um, he enrolled in Harvard in 1935 and read Keynes in 1936. So it was a very, like, very formative. Keynes was very formative on him. Um, but his PhD amb ambitions was interrupted with a stay as a naval officer on the destroyer USS Kearney during World War II. So he also got to be a veteran. Uh, and as I said, his uh, supervisor was Sean Peter, who was an evolutionary economist, quasi-Austrian, definitely not a Keynesian. Let's just put it like that, right? Uh, very critical of all things government. Um, to make him even more of a Keynesian, very funnily, he actually married a former student of Samuelson. <laughs> so, uh, as he was called Elizabeth uh, Faye Ringo, uh, and they had four children together. And he spent basically his whole academic life at Yale. So... Why should we talk about Tobin when it comes to macro, Otto? Because he he contribu contributed uh, to it in, in important ways. Um, his main contribution was in uh, giving a much richer role to the financial sector uh, and the uh, and uh, to to the connection between uh, saving and investment, uh, which is, of course, very important. And often the channels leading savings to investments is is very, uh, it's overlooked or it's, it's very crudely uh, implemented in, 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 in macroeconomic theory. Actually, Lucas, as we, we discussed a moment ago, thought that, you know, th thinks that the the financial sector was not that important. Uh, so it's sort of, of an add-on on, on to, to, to the economy. Uh, that was not the view of Tobin. Tobin said that uh, realized that um, savings, people who save, they will save by, uh, uh, not by, <laughs> simply by putting money in the bank and which would flow directly to investments but they will they will buy assets so mm -hmm. they would put together a portfolio so that's that's important and the the way uh, that the companies are going to invest is also important for how the the macro economy works and you can say that the on and off the the financial sector has played a uh, a uh, minor or a major role in 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 a, in, in macroeconomics, but uh, the financial crisis have put renewed emphasis on how the the, the financial sector works. Um, so and that's that's to a large degree with thanks to to Tobin for putting uh, his focus on that. The the channels leading from uh, 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 monetary policy. To uh, to the real economy uh, was also something he he he, he worked on. So yeah. um, so making the, the the model much much uh, richer uh, in terms of how this uh, savings and uh, investment uh, takes place in the economy was was his main main contribution. His uh, transaction mechanism, right, is what, yes. what we call this. Um, 
there is a renewed interest in him, definitely, right? Also in a world now with zero negative interest rates, it's it's interesting, not just Tobin's argument, but generally his argument is like, how much does this influence, right? And also obviously, how affluent are people generally? Like um, by the time the Tobin developed his theory, I mean, uh, it, it was a tougher economy for most families likely than it 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 has been in 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 the 21st century as well right so uh, and nowadays even uh, even young people show an interest in financial markets and and all these so so there's definitely some stuff there that that also makes him worth uh, worth revisiting he was very skeptical of rational expectations though right Yes, he was yeah. actually an early critic uh, of of rational expectations and I think that to to understand his criticism uh where uh the focus of Lucas was on how uh markets uh implement information in in, in already available in the economy uh Tobin focused much more on uh, market imperfections, yeah. and the idea that market imperfections that that uh, that uh, prices uh, were stiff for one reason or another could influence the economy. So, uh, so he had not as much as an eye for for these. Uh, stabilizing yeah. forces in the economy as uh, Lucas uh, and also consequently believed that you could <laughs> you could counter uh, act by economic policies yeah. so they disagreed on the role of stabilization uh, the, the role one could play uh, uh, by 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 uh, Using policy to to stabilize the the economy, which Tobin uh, did yeah. to a large extent, and he even he has a tax named after him, the Tobin oh, yeah. tax, the Tobin which tax, which uh, mentioned, uh, which was the idea, idea that that uh, that uh, movement, the capital movement, could be uh, destabilizing to the economy and that you could sim- simply by taxing uh, capital movements you could put some sand in the machinery <laughs> as it was called, called and to, to reduce uh, capital movements whereas um, if you look at it from from uh, Lucas perspective and again small monst- uh, mainstream perspective would be to say that Actually, capital movements tend to stabilize the economy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and if you if you if you put a brakes on capital movements, uh, you will uh, you information will flow slower, and that can destabilize the the economy. Um, so, for instance, under the the financial crisis, there was uh, uh, there was actually there was a ban uh, introduced in many countries against short selling. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and yeah. and I I think. Nowadays, it's it's realized that short selling actually played an important role. Oh it, yeah, it, it exposed some uh, the disequilibria in 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 the economy, but actually, uh, there's a difference between exposing something and creating them. Oh yeah, and and there there we have Tobin on the one end believing that that the the economy is not very efficient that that the uh, the the policymakers have a lot of uh, options to them to, to to change and influence and improve the economy. Where uh, Lucas uh, much more realized that uh, if you take into account the way the economy works, uh, there actually is uh, the the role for stabilization policy is much more limited. Yeah, and so it's not uh, and it. You need at the situation need to be really an exception, and an exception you can. It's very hard to spot yeah. for for policy to 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 have a role. Um, so and and I think this has been a great great treat uh, achievement by by uh, by rational expectation uh, economists is to to point out that that really a lot of policy advice. Is based on the idea that people they form the wrong expectations in a systematic way, and uh, there's there's no reason to 
to believe that they do. And and if they don't, then a lot of uh, the policy uh, instruments, they simply don't work. Yeah, exactly. And this goes back to the whole original discussion, right? Like uh, Keynes' famous quote, in the long run, we're all dead, right? So, so, so Keynesians, not necessarily academic Keynesians, but applied Keynesians, uh, policy advice and so on, tend to have a very big present bias, right? Like you see something, let's fix it now with, with what we have in our toolbox. And that that might lead to uh, to worse outcomes later on, or at least de- a definitely different outcomes, right? Like it's it, it an intervention will change something, right? Yes. Definitely, um, and that can actually maybe would be Lucas' argument uh, have an adverse uh, impact on on the expectation. And especially in the next episode, we'll talk more about about how uh, long term expectation uh, uh, forms and so on. But I do think it's interesting how this goes all the way back with. How present focused are you in how you view the economy? Um, uh, and there's uh, arguments on, on on both sides, of course. Um, he uh, he 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 was definitely like he he must have been a great teacher as well, though Tobin, right? Because like all his students, he, in many ways, he's like the quintessential. A saltwater Ivy League economist at Yale. There, so there's this story. It's even referenced in the Nobel uh, material uh, that uh, at the height of his teaching career, uh, economist students at Yale would walk around with a shirt with a small Q on it, referring to Tobin's Q, <laughs> which <laughs> which expresses a ratio between the market value of a physical asset uh, and the cost of producing that asset all over again, uh, which is a, an extremely nerdy reference. And I haven't been to Yale, so I don't know if they still walk, walk around with that, but. <laughs> <laughs> if you can convey your students to, to, to do that, I think that's a pretty pretty good statement of it. Um, he was also, you always, always talked about that, he was actually a forerunner of, of something that's extremely important in finance, which is portfolio theory, right? The idea that of diversification, the idea that you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. It, it's not so relevant for the macro discussion necessarily, but it's an important economic insight and good sound advice, right? Um, um and then finally, he's also known for the Tobit model, which anybody who went to graduate school or PhD studies certainly know, uh, for better or worse. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of hard to explain econom- econometrics uh, in a podcast. We will have to struggle with that later on because we have some very econometric-centric prices later on. But but basically, uh, the Tobit model is unlike a an ordinary least square or, or other type of line or regression. This is a censored model where, uh, which is really good if you have like a cap of certain values. So let's say, for instance, you don't want to count all values in the data set below zero. Um, um, but if you do that in like an ordinary least square, that will give a bias to the results. So so uh, uh, so with a Tobin model, you, you can eliminate that. Interpreting a Tobin model is where many people goes wrong. It's it's not for the for the faint hearted. I can trust me. It's uh, many many young PhD students have struggled with this in uh, in exam sets. But it's a very uh, uh, very well known model. Um, so um, I think that's it for today right? wouldn't you agree yes three great uh, great um, economists um, two Keynesian one uh, Chicago school monetarist whatever we want to call, call Lucas uh, rational ba- expectation rational expectation I think we could just call him so exactly uh, battling it out um, cool so thank you very, uh, thank you uh, dear listeners for spending time with us until next time stay rational Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us exploring the history of economic thought. You are welcome to email comments and suggestions to stefan at cpas.dk. Please like and share and recommend this podcast anywhere you can and think it's relevant. Until next time, stay rational. Mm-hmm.